I want you to leave. I prayed this. I just said it a moment ago because it's in my mind. I want you to leave different than the way you came in. Um, spiritually. Listen to what it says in Ezekiel 46, 9. Whoever enters by the north gate to worship, and that's what we've been doing, is to go out the south gate. And whoever enters by the south gate is to go out the north gate. No one, no one is to return to the gate by which he or she entered. What does that mean? That means we should leave here different than the way we came in. Not geographically with the doors, but with our spirit. And that's what I'm hoping for today. So I want to take, tell you a story about when I graduated high school in 1967. Yes, they had high schools in 67. Some of you were. And I went to parochial school for 12 years, eight, eight years in elementary, where I had the Sisters of Mercy who knew no mercy. They just beat you. And then in the four years of high school, I had the Christian brothers who were not very Christian. So it was a tough 12 years. But when we graduated in 67, some of our friends put a party together. Now, I was a young senior because for some reason in the 50s, all the Catholic schools jumped the kids up a, a year. So I was 16 when I was a senior. My birthday's in March, so to graduate in June, I just turned 17. But I took driver's ed, and my dad bought a brand new blue Chevy Caprice, and he allowed me to use it to go to this party. So this party was in Brooklyn, and as here, some of the houses are attached on one side, and then they have a driveway on the other side. And uh, you go up the stairs, a stoop uh, that's outside the first door. You open the first door. You have access there. But then on the wall, usually on your left, there's the mailboxes and the names of the people that the mailbox belongs to and a bell. And in order to get entry into the hallway now, you got to ring the bell for the name that you, the party you want to see. And then they ring back the bell so the door will open. Well, that's what happened on this day of this party. And I'm walking to the back rear apartment when I'm smelling this aroma that is just amazing. I mean, it wasn't cologne. It was food. It was just incredible. And then when I opened up the door after I knocked, then the heat of the, of the kitchen just hit me in the face, and, this, and the smell was even more intense. And I knew everybody in the room, so it was easy. It was a great setting. And uh, I went over to the first table where they had some chips and coleslaw potato salad. Hello? Um, and uh, I helped myself, plastic forks, knives, you know, paper plate. And I, on to my left, on this, one of these four burner stoves, stoves, there's this tray of chicken, golden chicken. And, and the garlic was brown, and the onions curled up, and there was a little rosemary, and it was amazing. In fact, it was so amazing. Look, I took a picture. Show them the picture. Show them the Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Come on, you, you haven't had lunch yet, so this is really looking good. Your mouth is starting to water now, right? We got another picture. Show them the other picture. Show them, yeah, there you go. There, a little lemon on the side. Little sage, it was amazing. Well, this chicken was even already cut up. So it was easy for me to take a drumstick, put it on my plate, go find the chair somewhere, do the balancing act, you know, with your lap and the, and the paper plate on your lap. And I have the plastic fork and the plastic knife, and I go to go into it, and, and it's not moving. And the plastic fork is bending, and the knife is wobbling. And I'm not thinking of it. I'm just thinking it's cheap silverware or plastic, right? So I pick up the drumstick with my hands, and I go to bite it, and I can feel the heat on my lips. I can actually feel or even taste the garlic and the onions. But all of a sudden, my teeth couldn't get into the meat. It just kind of stopped. And so I used these buck teeth of mine to kind of pull back the meat, and I looked down, and I was stunned. Look look what it looked like. Show, show them the next picture. Show them. Yeah, look at that. Look at that. Yeah, that's what it looked like. That's what, we got one more. We got one more. We got one more. Yeah, oh, yeah, nasty, nasty, nasty. It put a taste in my mouth. I wanted to rinse my mouth out with gasoline. It was terrible, horrible. And, and bless her heart, she meant well to cook the meal. I mean, she was young. She was a novice. She was brand new at cooking. Um, but here's the thing. The potential was there. The chicken was there. The stove was there, the pan was there, the garlic and onions were there. There was good intention. The problem was, it was half-baked. It was half-baked. So it couldn't be used. And uh, that was over 50 years ago. And I still have an issue with chicken. Talk about trauma. Talk about PTSD. I have PTSD with chicken. And um, I want to use that concept 
to talk about today's sermon called Half-Baked. The book of Hosea, Hosea, 7th chapter, 8th verse, NIV, it says this, Ephraim is a flat cake not turned over. New century version, like a pancake cooked only on one side is Ephraim. Message translation, Ephraim is half-baked. Now, a little background. Ephraim is another name for Israel. It was the northern part of the country. And this was a great season for them. Remember, they were an agricultural nation, an agricultural society, and they had a, they had a bumper crop. Harvest was amazing. The rains came, the crops grew, everybody was happy. There was commerce, there was prosperity. Um, they had religious freedom. They enjoyed the fact that they could worship their God any way they wanted. So they were in a good place. They enjoyed all the holidays that the Torah put in. In fact, they would read the Torah. They would go to worship services like what we do. They would have prayers. There would be the priests that would pray for them. There were singers and musicians just like we have. By the way, weren't they really good today? Come on. Put your hands together. Amazing. Amazing. They had singers and musicians just like we did. King David was an artist. He was a musician. He was a songwriter. And he introduced new instruments into the worship service that the worship service never had before. He put choirs together. He put singers together. He elevated the worship service in this day. And they were enjoying it. They were loving it. They had the Psalms. They had the, they had the uh, reading of Scripture. They had the priest. They had the leadership. They had godly expressions like praise God, God bless, hallelujah. They had all these religious uh, uh, behavior going on in their lives. And it was a great atmosphere. Similar to what we have. Similar to our building where we can come and worship God, where we can get teaching and get prayers and singing. And uh, the problem was, the reason why God was using Hosea to say what he said is because in the days of the Israelites, they had formulas and they had traditions, but it was very robotic. Religion could become robotic. You could be a Christian and your religious experience become very north of the neck. You know what to do. You know what to stand. You know what to say. Hallelujah. And it lacks the power. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy that there's a, they have a form of godliness, but they're lacking power. And that's what was happening here in Hosea's day. And God wanted to get their attention. Because the Israelites then, they wanted happiness. They didn't want holiness. They wanted God to change their negative circumstances. They didn't want God to change them. They wanted God to forgive them of their sins, but they didn't want repentance. They didn't want to turn from the things that were not pleasing to God. And so God sends Hosea to give them this, this understanding or this metaphor of, of where they're at spiritually, like a flat cake not turned over. Why that was real to them? Well, in those days, if you wanted bread, you didn't go to the bodega to get a loaf of bread. You had to make it for the most part. And what they would do is they would build a fire, and then they would line on the side of the fire these flat rocks. And then they would get uh, water and flour, and they would make a patty out of it, like a tortilla. Now, you could add an egg, you could add salt, you could add spices, you could do whatever. But the basic ingredient was flour and water. And they would make this tortilla, and once it had some body, they would slap it on the flat rock, and it would heat up. And then with a spatula or their fingers, they would turn it over and then cook the other side. And now you have bread. If you only turned it, if you did not turn it over and you only cooked on one side, you ruined the bread. The bread was half-baked. It couldn't be used. It wasn't pleasure, pleasurable. It, it was a waste. And that's what God was trying to get the people of God to understand. You got, you got all these traditions and you got all these styles and stuff like that, but you're a, a cake half-baked. You're not turned over on the other side. So how am I going to use you? The intention is there. The possibilities are there, but it's, it's not... Not working. You're not cooked on both sides. And half-baked bread is not even appealing. It's not usable. It's a waste. So consider this. Is it possible that like the Israelites, we have all the, all the things in place with worship and praise and musicians and for our Christian experience, teaches the Bible, all of that. We got it all going for us. Um, but is it possible that I might be half-baked in my discipline? My devotions. I mean, I come to church, but the rest of the week, I'm not really living full on for God. I, is it possible that I'm half-baked in my reading the Bible or in my Christian life? Is it possible? I mean, I have the, I have the potential. I mean, we got scriptures and churches and teachers 
and we got the Holy Spirit, the potential is there, but is it possible that I'm really maybe cooked on only one side and not the other side? I'm not completely turned over to God. And um, if that's true, how could God use me? If my marriage is not completely turned over to God, how can God use our marriage to speak to other marriages? I mean, there are marriages that need help together, in the church, outside the church. If, if, if my conduct, not in here, but out there, if my conduct, if I'm half-baked in my conduct, in my conversations, in my actions, in my reactions, um, how could God use me? If, if in my entertainment, I'm half-baked, on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, whatever, whatever social media you're on, if you're half-baked and you have one style when you're there but another style when you're here, how's God going to use you? Somewhere you're going to end up being embarrassed about your testimony. And um, I, I want all of us to be full on for God. We're in a season, a Nehemiah season. Most churches around the world are rebuilding, rebuilding. We had a, a, a team meeting not too long ago, Saints team meeting. And, and, the, and the theme was we got to rise and build. We got to rise and build. And people are afraid with COVID. And every, new, every, every week we hear there's a new strain out there and you need another vaccination and you got to put on your mask. And, and all these people need to be built up. And they need our lives to help them with that. But if I'm half-baked, I'm not going to want to live my Christian life out those doors. I'll do it in here, but not out there. Not at the gym. Not while I'm driving a car. Not in my decision-making. Not in my actions or my reactions. But think of and listen to this. I love the fact that Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. In Luke, Luke 19, you know the story between Marie and I. We were living together, divorcees, doing drugs, when some people prayed for us. And to me, that was a joke. What are you praying for me? I went to 12 years of parochial school. You don't have to pray for me. That was my attitude. But they prayed for us. And then when we got back from this vacation we were on, drug-ridden, immoral, they said, come to church with us. And I did. And for all the other reasons, you have to hear Maria's testimony. But anyway, we did go. But that night, on a Sunday night, we got saved. September 1975. That's, over, that's 47 years ago. And, and the reason why I'm saying this, I love the fact that God delivered us from drugs and immorality and the fact that we've been married all this time and we have children that are serving the Lord. I, I, I'm happy about all that. I, I'm happy about the fact that Jesus Christ has... Well, there are about 7,000 promises in the Bible, and I love the one that says that he wants to give us a life and life more abundantly. I love that, John 10.10. 10. I love that. But in order to receive those things, in order to be in the center of his will, Jesus has to be Lord, Lord of all. My whole life given over, my marriage, my conversations, my attitude, the way I drive, the way I work, all those things. What I watch on TV or what I listen to, it, it all it has to be under the lordship of Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus, in, in the Sermon on the Mount, in Luke's recording, it says this in Luke 6.46. It says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? And the, whenever you hear Jesus use, repeat the word twice, like verily, verily, or truly, truly, or Lord, Lord, he's putting an emphasis on the statement that he's making. He's saying, Lord, Lord, why do you not do what I say? Or do not do what I say. He doesn't want us to absorb all this Christian knowledge, this Christian information, memorizing verses and everything, and yet not applying it to our life. He doesn't want us to substitute knowledge for, for obedience. And it's so important for us to understand that. And uh, I want to apply, I want all of us to apply the teachings that we hear all the time here in a way so that God could use our life. And not that we would be half-baked. Listen to this in Ezekiel 33, 31. My people come to you as they usually do, like what we do every week. And they sit before you and they hear your words, but they do not put them into practice. Their mouths speak of love, but their hearts are greedy for injustice, unjust gain. Indeed, to them, you are nothing more than one who sings love songs with a beautiful voice and play an instrument well. For they hear your words, but do not put them into practice. That's half-baked. This is what Jesus said in Matthew's recording of the Sermon on the Mount. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man or a foolish woman or a foolish person. In other words, 
If I come and hear God, I come to church all the time, and I hear what God is saying through the uh, encouragement, through the announcements, through the sermon, through the songs, but I don't apply and I don't implement in my life. God's saying, Michael, you're foolish. Really, you're wasting your time. You're hearing things, but you're not applying them. One more. Jesus is half-brother. Book of James, verse, chapter 1, verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Imagine that. This is written to Christians. This is written to Christians. Christians can come to church week after week, even serve in ministry, and hear the words that God's speaking to them and be deceived because they don't implement it. They don't apply it. I don't want that for us. I don't want that for me. I don't want that for my family. I don't want that for you. I want us to be men and women of God. Then we hear the word of the God. We say, yes, Lord. So be it, Lord. Speak. Your servant is listening. Remember, on that glorious day, we all want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You don't want to hear, half done, good and faithful servant. Because that's not going to be said. It's either well done or it's not done. And we've got to make sure that we understand how important it is. Now, listen, I believe we all want to be the Christians that we read about in the book of Acts. You know, Acts 2.42, they were devoted to the disciples, the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, to fellowship, and to prayer. There was four fu fun fundamental truths that they were devoted to because they understood the lordship of God. You know, in the book of Acts, 92 times it says, Lord. 92 times. In the New Testament, 747 times it says Lord. More than it even says Savior. Now, is he our Savior? Absolutely. Does he save us from things that are not good? Absolutely. But he still is more concerned about his lordship over our lives than anything else. When Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, he writes this, that we, would to be, that we are to live in a righteous way in undivided devotion to the Lord. Undivided. So that means I can't be half-baked, because if I'm half-baked, I would be divided, not undivided. I, I want to be sold out for Jesus. I want all of us to be sold out for Jesus. Like I said, in every, every aspect of our life, not just here. I, I don't want to have one set of clothes for here and another set of clothes when I'm out there. I don't want to have one, one kind of behavior here or conversation here or choice of words here and then a whole other choice out there. I want it to be consistent. I want all of us to be consistent. There was a household in 1 Corinthians 16. There was a household, household, called, household of Stephanus that was completely devoted to the Lord. One translation as they were addicted. Now, in our day, addictions, of course, has a negative content, but it meant it in a positive way. They were driven to serve God. They understood the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And I don't want us, again, to be one way here and another way out there and Unfortunately, we could be serving in ministry and not be where we should be. We could be faithful to a, a ministry here, and we're all about ministry. That's what um, uh, Growth Track is all about. But what good is it if we're faithful in ministry here and then out there, where we live, where we work, where we go to school, we're not? I have a story for you. Uh, I attended a pastor's conference here in the city. And it was in the afternoon, and it was like from 10 to like 2. There was a lunch in between, and it was amazing. And I came down pumped. I mean, I was really, I, I, was, I was really, I was going to jump over walls. I was just really pumped. And I was coming back to the office, and I go outside, and it's starting to drizzle, starting to rain. And I'm walking up the block where I remembered I parked my car. And when I get to the place where I parked it, or at least I thought I parked it, it wasn't there. So I'm thinking, you know, it was all that emotion in the pastor's meeting. I probably forgot. I went a little further up the block, and it wasn't there either. So now I turn around, and I come back. And I'm confident. I know where I parked the car, but it wasn't there. And then it dawned on me, something that never happens in New York. My car was stolen. It was stolen. I'm in a prayer meeting, and they steal my car. All right. So I'm standing there. It's drizzling. It's raining. I know I didn't have the full-baked look of, uh, on my face. I was definitely half-baked at the moment. And I was just standing on the corner when a pastor passes by in his car. He rolls down the window and goes, Pastor Derso, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. He goes, well, what's wrong? I said, well, I think they stole my car. He says, uh, well, I, I could drive you back to your church. I said, yeah, well, I got a report. He said, all right, 
there's a precinct right down the block. Let's go. I'll take you. So don't you hate it when somebody acts more of a Christian than you? You know what I mean? It's like, stop being so Christ-like. I really don't like that right now. Feel more like the devil and your old Jesus up here, you know. So anyway, I get in the car, and he takes me to the precinct. And uh, I get out. I go inside the precinct. I go up to the desk where the officer was. And he says, can I help you? And I said, yes, I have to report my car stolen. He says, okay, you've got to fill out this report. By the way, where was it stolen? I says, well, if you just come out your precinct and you cross over to the block and go up the block, I think it was somewhere in the middle. He says, on the other side of the street? I said, yeah. He said, oh, that's not our precinct. That's not our jurisdiction. No, no, wait, wait, wait. It's out the door, round the corner, on the other side of the street. Yeah, I know what you're saying. But that's not our district. You have to go to this other precinct that he tells me in Brooklyn, all the way down Ocean Parkway. So I go out, my friend's there. So, Pastor Durst, what happened? I tell him the story. He said, well, come on, I'll drive you. See, being so nice. Hate you. So he takes me, and now it's a little late, close, getting around near 4 o'clock. It's traffic. It's raining. It's not been a good day. I, I lost the anointing and the blessing from the pastor. It's definitely gone. I'm on empty right now. So he takes me to the precinct, and it really was an old house that they turned into a precinct. And there were police cars and vans all over the place, just parked everywhere. Because, you know, there's no parking in New York. And um, I walk inside, and it was, it was pretty busy. It was, there, was, there was officers all over, either coming or going. And I make my way to the desk where there was an officer sitting. And I says, uh, he says, yes, can I help you? And I said, yeah, I have to report my car. It was stolen, and they told me this is the priest I have to come to. He says, okay, well, look, um, officer, and he points to the... Uh, makeshift decks. It wasn't even a desk. It was like a car table. You opened up and he says, uh, that officer will help you. And I said, okay. So this officer was sitting behind this makeshift, de makeshift desk. Papers all over. Files. It's just pretty, pretty kind of messy. And, and she was sitting there looking down and she's writing. So I, I kind of get in front of her desk and I'm just standing there waiting for her to recognize me. And she keeps writing. And you know, when you're waiting, if you wait like half a minute, it seems like two hours, right? And she skips writing. So I think I got to get her attention. You know, I got to help her. So I kind of... You know, I just kind of shifted my weight. Just get her to see this movement going back and forth. But she's still... So I did the next best thing. I... You know, just bouncing on the balls of your feet, right? Just, She's got to see me. She didn't see me going back and forth. She's got to see me going up and down. Still nothing. I know. Uh, uh, I see you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't want you to see me. No, I'm not even here. I pushed her button by clearing my throat. And I, I said, I'm sorry, uh, ma'am, but they told me to come here and you would give me a report to fill out. She says, yes, just wait a minute. Okay, I'll wait. And so while this is going on simultaneously, other officers have gathered, and it was a very narrow area. They're all gathered, and they're all talking and going back and forth, and somebody put his stuff on her table, her desk, uh, which there wasn't much room. And all of a sudden, she lets out, is this a locker room? Is this a locker room? Is this your, don't leave it here, but she used some adjectives, you know what I'm saying? Like, is this a bleeping, bleeping locker room and you're putting your bleeping, bleeping stuff on my bleeping, bleeping desk? Now, I'm traumatized, guys. I'm in a wetsuit, you know, just a little dripping hair, you know, nasty, tired. Everybody's got guns. I'm nervous. I'm just telling you. I'm nervous. And so finally, the guy leaves and he's yelling back at her. And, ah, she finally hands me a clipboard. She goes, here, now go fill it out and don't ask me for a pen. No, no problem. I'll cut myself and write it in blood before I... <laughs> so there was only, on this side of the office, there was only one small wooden bench. And so I wanted to go sit down and write. And uh, there was a young girl handcuffed to the other side. And she's crying and she looks like she spent the whole night in the streets. And I sit down, and she looks at me. Goes, Please, can you help me? Can you, I didn't know there were drugs in the house. I, my brother had drugs, and I didn't know that they arrested me. And, I, and I'm saying, you know, I'm sorry. You know, I'm 
I want my car back. I really don't even want my car anymore. Like, it's, you can keep the car. As I'm trying to explain to her, I can't do nothing. But all of a sudden, I hear, Pastor Durso, how are you, man? And I look up, and there's this handsome police officer standing there with his arms out like this, walking toward me. I got up. I hugged him. I didn't know who he was. I was going to hug anybody. I needed, I needed a hug. I needed a kiss. I needed some love. So he's hugging me, you know, the patting on the back. And Pastor Jerusalem, how are you doing? I says, oh, I'm doing fine, my brother. I'm sorry. Where do I know you from? Oh, you spoke at the men's meeting a few weeks ago. What a great service. I said, oh, thanks. I, I appreciate that. Well, why are you here? He was really loud. He was anxious. He was excited. Why are you here? I said, well, I, my car got stolen and I have to report it. Goes, Who's taking care of you? I said, well. Oh, she'll take care of you. She sings in the choir at our church. Yep. True story. Does she sing in the choir at our church? Absolutely. Is she a Christian? Absolutely. She was just half-baked. See, that's what happens when we're half-baked. We have all the potential to be the man or woman of God God wants us to be. But when we don't totally give ourselves over to God, then we differentiate between when we are godly and when we're not. The words that we use, the behavior that we use, the smile that we use or do not use. And um, I want to make sure that we're all full on for God. Realize that chicken story that I told you, and that's also true, that's over 50 years ago. And it still affects me. Don't ever invite me over for chicken. I won't eat it. I'll eat broccoli before I eat chicken. It left a bad taste in my mouth. Guys, when we're half-baked, we leave a bad taste in people's mouths. When, when we tell them, oh, come to our, we're having a concert at our church or we're having a testimony, you should come. And we talk about church business a little bit, but then we act in a different way. That leaves a bad taste in their mouth. We're saved, but we're half-baked. We really can't be used to the the degree God wants to use us. Listen, we might be half-baked in our marriages. What, is our, what do our kids see? What do the in-laws see? What do our families see if we're half-baked in our marriage? We might be half-baked in religion, in other relationships, or maybe in, a, in a, the way we work at, uh, the way we work in our business. We might be half-baked in, uh, in our prayer life. You know it's important to pray. Come to the prayer meeting on Wednesday, but the other days, well, we're just busy. It just slips away from you're saved. I'm not questioning your salvation. But being half-baked prevents God from using you the way he wants to use you. I can be half-baked in my study of scripture. I can be half-baked in serving, serving in the church. You know, I don't know if you all belong to this church, if this is your church. I hope it is. But if it's not, whatever church you attend to on a regular, you need to serve there. Where you're planted is where you'll flourish. So it's so important for us not to be half-baked and not just be a, a spectator. But someone that rolls up their sleeves and gets in the game, if I can put it that way, gets some skin in the game. Tony Evans is famous for saying this, without him, you cannot. But without you, he will not. Without him, we cannot. But without you, he, God, will not. Imagine if Moses only went halfway to Egypt. Imagine if Noah only built half an ark. Imagine if Joshua only walked around the walls halfway. Imagine if David only swung his slingshot halfway. Imagine if Jesus only went halfway to Calvary. Halfway is not all the way really not good. And the disciples, there was probably a season when they were being taught by Jesus that they were half-baked. We know that they had prejudice issues. Uh, they slept when they were supposed to be praying. Uh, they had this issue with competition with one another. And, and it, it was just amazing that they were Jesus and they had these issues. But after the Holy Spirit came upon them in Acts 2, they were sold out. They turned their world, Acts 17, upside down for God. They understood what Lordship meant. I so want us to be those men and women of God that are sold out for God. The 
and that we're just not a church where people gather on a Sunday and then live out their lives any old way. Um, think about this in closing. The singers, you can come, please. Remember the story about the 5,000? Which obviously there was more than just 5,000 men. There were women and children. And they wanted to feed the multitudes. So they brought Jesus five loaves and two fish, five loaves of bread. Suppose the bread was half-baked. Could Jesus have used it to feed the multitude? No, of course not. It would be a waste. The bread had the potential to be used, but because it was half-baked, it became useless. Brothers and sisters, I don't want us to be useless. I want us all to be used to the fullest potential that God has for each and every one of us. David writes this Psalm in 8611. He writes this, give me an undivided, undivided heart, totally given over to God. Can I pray for you? Can I ask you all to stand, please? Please? Okay. Before I pray for us as a group, I'm going to ask you first to close your eyes and bow your heads for a moment. Because there might be some of us here that we haven't given our lives to Christ. We need to do that. Good people don't go to heaven. Saved people go to heaven. The only way we're saved is through Jesus. He's the way to the Father. Maybe you've never committed yourself to Christ. You're here. I'm so happy. Maybe you're watching online. I'm glad. But you need to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, first and foremost. Or maybe, maybe, maybe you did at one time and used to attend church, but you know, life gets busy, life gets messy, and you drifted. You've, you're not where you should be. You say, Pastor Jerry, so I, I want to be with God the way I should be. If that's you, with every eye closed, every head bowed, all I want to do is lift up one hand. Just lift it straight up. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Don't be ashamed. Thank you. Up in the balcony. Thank you. God bless you. You can put it down. Lord, for every hand that went up, you know exactly where they are. You knew they would be here today. It's not coincidence that you would give them an invitation to accept you as Lord and Savior. So, God, I pray that you bring revelation to them. Let them realize the love you have for them. That if they were the only person on earth, you would have still went to Calvary and died for them. To give them of their sins. Give them a holy confidence that they can walk with you day after day. And your Holy Spirit will empower them to do that. I ask that you make that very clear to them today. In Christ's name. Now for all of us. God, we're your church in this community. And we don't want to be half-baked. We don't ever want to be found in a position where we're acting one way when we should be acting in a Christ-like way. We don't want to leave a bad taste in anyone's mouth by our decisions or our choices or our behavior or our conversation or our words, even the way we look. I pray, God, that you would bring revelation to each and every one of us so that we won't be deceived. We heard your word today and that we will apply it to our lives so that we can be the men and women of God you've called us to be. For every single one in the room, everyone watching online, no one, no one is exempt. Everybody, technicians, musicians, singers. God, we want to be sold out, sold out, sold out. Completely turned over for you so that you can use us like you've never used us before. This world needs you, Lord. That's what this world needs. It doesn't matter who's in the White House. It doesn't matter whether we're in a recession or the economy's booming. It doesn't matter. Any of those things don't matter. They need Jesus. And we're the Jesus they're going to see. So I pray you make that very real, oh God, and help us. Be those men and women that are totally turned over to you so that we can serve you and that your name will always receive glory from the multitudes. And I pray this in Christ's name.